In this series, we're generating the microcode for the SAP 6502, which is based on the SAP 1, but it's been modified to run 6502 instructions directly. I just want to note that some of this video was recorded while I had COVID, and my voice hasn't completely recovered. I've implemented a number of instruction opcodes so far, and in this video, we're going to add another 15 to the tally. All of the instructions so far just go in a straight line, and we want them to go as fast as possible. But sometimes, the flow of code needs to take a different direction. Hopefully, we can avoid this happening. Back to the microcode. This is Jim Clark, founder of Silicon Graphics, where he designed and commercialized the geometry engine. By his estimation, writing the microcode is approximately half the work, which is why I decided to make an entire series for the microcode for the SAP 6502. Out of curiosity, I asked GPT Chat which CPU had the largest microcode. Apparently, Knight's Landing and Knight's Mill from Intel were the biggest. Knight's Landing coming in at 3.5 megabytes, while Knight's Mill is 4.3 megabytes. To put this into perspective, when it was released, Windows 95 at a minimum required 4 megabytes, so modern microcodes getting quite complicated. We're making good progress in this playlist, but this video took longer than I planned, so today I'll just go over branching. Next, a stack operations, then jump, jump to subroutine, and return from subroutine. Then finally, some tidy up, which will include add and subtract in decimal mode. Now, this video will be one of the harder videos in the series, but I encourage you to stick with it. All the codes are available on GitHub, so you can go over it again at your own pace. This is the BPL, or branch on positive result instruction. It looks at the negative flag and branches if it's clear. Before we implement the branch instructions in this project, we need to make sure that the status register is being used properly. The ALU itself takes the decimal and carry flags as inputs, and in turn, it's capable of setting or clearing the negative, overflow, zero, and or carry flags. I think the trickiest flag is the overflow flag, so let's look at that in more detail. Now, let's not forget what can go wrong with the overflow flag. In the past, there have been some pretty nasty consequences for getting this one wrong. When using two's complement, if we perform an addition or a subtraction, the overflow flag is set if the sign of the output isn't appropriate for the sign of the given inputs. It's also important to note that overflow is calculated differently based on whether we're doing an addition or a subtraction. If you're a bit rusty on how the overflow flag works, you might want to look at the status register video from the SAP 6502 hardware series. I'm going to update the emulation code to make sure that we calculate overflow during addition. We compare the sign of the A hold register and the B register against the sum output. We set the overflow if the sign of A and B match, but they don't match the sign of the output. We can reuse this code for subtract with carry. The main difference being that we need to just invert the contents of the B register before we use it. Apart from the ALU, there are actually a number of instructions that can directly set or clear certain flags, specifically overflow, decimal, interrupt, and carry. We can see these instructions here, and it's the top three bits of the opcode that determine which flag is set or cleared. The bottom five bits are set to the value of one eight hexadecimal. In the real hardware, we use the 74HC138 to implement these instructions, and we merge these signals with those coming from the ALU before they go to the status register. As a reminder, these flag signals go into a 74HC1518-1 multiplexer, and this selects the flag signal sent to the sequencer controller. Because I've connected the 74HC138 directly to the output of the instruction register, 
The microcode engine doesn't actually need to know which flag's involved or whether it's being set or cleared. All it has to do is assert the flag inst signal from the controller sequencer, which in turn enables the 74HC138, which can directly set or clear the appropriate flag. That's all good and well for the microcode generator, but the emulator also needs to implement these instructions. So, I just check to see whether the flag int signal is asserted. If so, I have a big switch statement which will either set or clear the appropriate flag within the status register. I'll enable all of these instructions through SAP 6502 cycles, compile it, and success. And as you go out, watch out for the special branch. <laughs> I don't see what's so special about that. I've got a degree in computer science. That's what. <laughs> yeah, that's quite special. Yeah. We have a total of eight branch instructions which use either the negative, overflow, zero, or carry flag. I've seen it argued online that the branch instruction is required for a machine to be Turing complete. Well, I happen to be in the no category on this one. I'll put forward three pieces of evidence. The first is this paper by Rojas, and I'm not sure if his name is pronounced Rojas or Rojas, so apologies if I get it wrong. In this paper, he states that conditional branching is not necessary for universal computation in von Neumann computers. He just needed four instructions, load, store, increment, and go to. As a side note, load and store do need a mechanism for indirect memory access. There's also a paper out there that states that it can be done with a single move instruction on an x86 architecture. I believe they use the addition in the effective address calculation. And I thought the title was a little clickbaity because they still need to use a jump. The next piece of evidence is this little loop here, which is from my pure Turing playlist. This is capable of emulating a 6502, although rather slowly. I've linked an IEEE Spectrum article on it below. The main difference compared to the Rojas is that I use addition rather than an increment. The loop itself is unconditional. Remember that I've actually used this code to play Apple II Pac-Man. You should look up the playlist if you have any doubts about it. Let me know what you think in the comments, and admittedly, it does depend a little bit on whether and how you define halt. That said, conditional branches are a common way to make machines Turing complete, and they're easier to use. My point is that they're not an absolute requirement. Let's look at this fragment of code here. We have a couple of instructions, and then at location B003, we have the opcode F0, which is the BEQ, or branch if equal instruction. This looks at the zero flag. If it's set, it takes the offset, which is three, and adds it to the next instruction location, which is B005. The result is that the program will skip to location B008. If the zero flag is clear, then it ignores the offset and starts executing from location B005. One of the interesting things about the branch instruction is that it can go to a location that's either before or after the branch itself. To understand how it does this, we need to look at two's complement numbers. This is a way of representing negative numbers. And it's done by somewhat arbitrarily making the most significant bit a negative value. In this case, we make bit 7 equal to minus 128. If we want to represent the value minus 16, then we set the top four bits of the byte, which is equal to F0 in hexadecimal. When we convert it back to decimal, we start with minus 128, then add 64, plus 32, plus 16, and this gives us minus 16 as the answer. One of the problems we have with the branch instruction is that the offset's 8 bits, but the program counter itself is 16 bits. This means we need to convert the offset from an 8-bit number to a 16-bit number. We do this through a process called sign extension. We take bit 7 of the original offset and copy it into all of the upper bits. That's bits 8 through 15. If bit 7 is clear, 
bits 8 through 15 are all set to 0. But if bit 7 is set, then bits 8 through 15 are set to FF in hexadecimal. Now, bit 15 becomes our negative number, which is minus 32768. In this case, when converting from 8 bits to 16 bits, minus 16, which is F0 in its 8-bit form, becomes FF F0 in the 16-bit form. I use the U or unsigned flag for sign extension during branch instructions. I'll need to update this in the emulator. In the real hardware, the sign bit of the B register, which is B7, goes directly into the fifth input of the 74HC151, which is used to select the status bit going into the sequencer controller. I can't think of any other instructions that use the U flag, it's mainly for sign extension in the branch instructions. In the emulation code, if flag select is set to the U flag, then I look at bit 7 of the B register and use that to decide whether or not to select the status bit going into the sequencer controller. The first thing I want to do is read the offset into the B register. I do this by performing a main memory read from the location pointed to by the program counter, and I have to remember to increment the program counter after reading this offset. Next, I copy this into the EAL register. To do this, I have to run it through the ALU because we can't actually read the output of the B register directly. I set flag select to be the U register, then in the next micro instruction, I want to set EAH to be FF if the sign bit of the B register is set, and I want it to be 0 if the sign bit is clear. By the end of decode relative, I should have the offset in 16-bit sign extended form in the EAL and EAH registers. Rather than writing each branch instruction individually, I'm going to come up with some generic branch code. We have a switch statement which determines which of the flags we're looking at, and whether we branch on set or clear. Now, you might have noted that I haven't actually written any microcode yet. The most important thing here is to set the flag select bits on the control word. I do read the status register, but this is more for debug than anything else. My first instinct was to use an if statement based on the branch if variable, and I probably should have stuck with this, but I decided I'd get smart and incorporate branch if directly into the microcode. If branch if is clear, then I just end the instruction, but if it's set, I want to do a 16-bit addition of the EA register to the PC register. Now, remember that the B register already contains the same value as the EAL register. I just need to move the PCL into the A hole register, perform an ALU addition, and put the result back into the PCL register. I have to look at the P flag to see if a page boundary is being crossed. I move EAH into the B register and PCH into the A hole register. If the P flag is clear, then I want to do an add with carry set to zero with the result going back to PCH. But if the P flag is high, then I'm going to do the same addition with the carry flag set, and this allows the page boundary crossover to the upper 8 bit address calculation. Now, I'll just compile it quickly to make sure I haven't made any errors. Note that I haven't actually enabled any of the branch instructions yet, so this should run. OK, that's good. Let's try it with the BPL instruction enabled. Compile. Run. And nothing. Let's test the BPL instruction in isolation. So I'll enable this alone early in SAP 6502 cycles. Compile it. Still nothing. So yep, it's the BPL instruction that's failing. I'm going to go back to my old trick of implementing the BPL instruction in C code and making sure that my understanding of it's correct. This also gives me a reference that I can compare against the macro code. We do a main memory read. We sign extended into offset, then increment the program counter past offset. Next, we check the negative flag of the status register. And if it's clear, we add the offset to our current program counter location. Let's compile this. Yep, that seems to be running, so my understanding of BPL is correct. Now, I want to find out where this C code disagrees with the microcode. 
I can do this by adding this little if statement here, which just looks at the program counter location generated by the microcode and compares it against the one generated by the C code. I'll put this int error equals one so I can set a breakpoint. We've hit the breakpoint, so let's examine this a bit more closely. The C code generated a program counter location of FAC7, while the microcode is generating a value of F9, F5. By stepping through the code, I can see that it fails on the third attempt to use the BPL instruction. So now we can step through the microcode on this failing instruction. Specifically, I want to see what the control wires are telling the machine to do. The first micro instruction does the fetch, and I probably won't see this because it may have a different opcode. I'm at the third micro instruction in the sequence, and the control word is 4000FA. Now, I want to move the B register into EAL, so I need to instruct the ALU to use the ALU B reg command. Now, these are bits 12 through 16 of the control word and I know that the instruction for passing through the B register is 1A. So why are these bits in the control word set to zero? Have you spotted it yet? I didn't move the ALU command into the correct bit position. I need to shift it left by ALU op to achieve this. That's got to be it. This should fix it. All right, I'll give it a try. Compile, and we've hit the same error. It's a good, strong, powerful run. Oh, good heavens! Oh! God. The third micro instruction is showing 1A, which is the pass through of B through the ALU, so at least we've fixed that problem. I'll step over some more microcode instructions and see what I find. Fourth micro instruction. Fifth micro instruction. Remember that the micro instructions start at step zero, so that's why the fifth micro instruction occurs at step four. Sixth micro instruction. Now that's odd. Why are the control wires all set to zero? And we have ourselves another head slap moment. Remember earlier that I said I should have stuck with the if statement? Well, the way I've written the set micro instruction routine, it increments the step counter when flag is set, which means I should always write the flag equals zero microcode first. But here in the BPL instruction, branch if will be clear, so I'll write the microcode for the flag set condition first, this will increment the step counter, and the flag clear zero will be written into the next micro instruction location. Then, when I actually do write the next micro instruction, it'll overwrite the previous branch if zero case microcode. I can fix this by using the if statement that I was planning to use in the first case. Now, I have to admit I'm being a bit slack here. I'd never write code like this when I was at NVIDIA. At a very minimum, I'd put an error check here, or I'd figure out another way to do it. But when I write code for myself, I tend to think I'll remember all of these corner cases. Not so this time. All right, now let's compile and run that and see how we go. Excellent, the code for BPL seems to be working now. I'll enable all the other branch instructions and see how we go. I'll need to comment out my error checking C code because that was just specific for BPL. Let me do that. And success. It seems to be running, so I'm going to sit back and play Pac-Man for a moment. I'll speed it up so it's a little less boring to watch. This isn't actually just for fun. I know that some of the instructions don't get executed until deep within the Pac-Man code, so I want to exercise it properly. I'll end this video here, but we are getting awfully close to the end. See you in the next video.